Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-staged paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guests to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. Your journey begins now. And you all have of the known and unknown. What do we understand? What answers are we trying to achieve? Are there answers? Tonight, we gather to find more verity. Join us as we take the journey into the unknown. This is the Fantastic Journey Podcast with your hosts, Gavin Kelly and Paula Purcell. Well, welcome to the Fantastic Journey Podcast, everyone. I'm Gavin Kelly, and sitting right next to me is my lovely wife, Paula Purcell. How are you today, Paula? I'm doing pretty good, just trying to stay warm. I hear you, I hear you. We are back. We wound up taking kind of a long break, but uh, it was well-deserved for all the stuff that we have been doing. And uh, tonight is a kickoff of the Fantasmic Journey podcast season three and uh, before we get into it Paula's got some more uh, what's new what's news in the weird news or well I kind of went with a theme what's the theme cold that sucks (laughs) (laughs) I it kind of you know someone had posted on Facebook today about hell freezing over Kind of gave me the logistics of well, there is actually a town called Hell. There's a town and called. Where is, where is Hell located? In Michigan. Really? Yeah. There's a Hell in Michigan. There's a Hell. There's a Hell in Michigan, <laughs> and it's a negative twelve. Oh my God. <laughs> so that that technically speaking is uh, Hell has frozen over. Now I just got to see if pigs are gonna fly next. No comment. <laughs> Uh, We've already had that discussion before. Uh, I mean, everybody has played in. And, and the deal is, I have looked up a couple of stories. It involves our poor winter scenario. Yeah. Of course, everybody needs to keep warm because there's basically the whole polar vortex is hitting a lot of people. And a lot of people up north has having electrical issues now. I had seen pictures of people actually taking pictures inside their house where electric is freezing inside their house and seeping through so everybody needs to take care and take care of all that and with with all my known and best i have a couple of stories okay winter related oh they're winter related they're winter related oh boy take it away stories that happened in the past 24 hours Okay, well, that's good. 24 so, hours is good. Yeah, in the past 24. A local man was arrested early Wednesday morning at Walmart after walking around the parking lot yelling cold weather puns at shoppers. He told me he was going to change the stop sign to see, say, freeze. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was dressed up in some clear plastic that looked hand-painted baby blue to really get the whole ice look down. He was also trying to talk like 
Arnold did in the Batman movie. I thought it was pretty, pretty funny, said one shopper we spoke with. Not everyone thought the man's puns were funny, though. The man told me I need to cool it on the makeup I was wearing. I told, I took serious offense to that. Who says that to a... Uh, let's see. I've, I've lost my spot. So this guy is dressed up like Elsa, talking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, actually more like Mr. Freeze. Okay. <laughs> uh, and authorities were called after a few citizens were concerned in the man's well-being and mental state. When he show, when we showed up to arrest him, he told my officers they needed to chill. They thought it was pretty funny, but we still brought him in for questioning. Oh, jeez. <laughs> said one police department's representative we spoke with. The man was released after making more cold weather jokes on the way to the department. <laughs> They're like, we got to get him out of the car <laughs> and away from us. Oh, and here is the next one. Ice cold beer is great. Frozen beer is not. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I don't. Do, I don't do either of them. We don't drink beer, but I had I could not pass this story up. All right, so do explain how okay. frozen beer is better than beer. Well, it the whole concept is alcohol is not supposed to freeze, okay? Well, that's true. All right, well, there is a certain limitation on alcohol. When you get to a certain deviation in, in temperature, uh -huh. like in the negatives... Beer freezes? Beer can freeze. Wow. It has been said. Hold on. My little phone died. Oh, okay, here we go. That is why, with a historic deep freeze gripping the Midwest, beer deliveries are on hold in some parts of the region. Temperatures are so low that, bre that beer will freeze. Around 32 degrees or slightly lower, depending on alcohol content, on the trucks before it can be delivered. <laughs> beer is freezing on the beer trucks. <laughs> wow. So that makes it even interesting. Keg beer in trucks were frozen Tuesday before temperatures even reached their coldest. Jeez. Most of the folks up north are not delivering, said Mike Megan, president of Minnesota Beer Wholesalers. Uh... Most of the folks up north are not delivering, said Michael Bent, president of Minnesota Beer Wholesalers Association. Most distributors are not delivering in the Twin Cities down south and out west. In Minneapolis, the temperature Wednesday hit minus 26 degrees with a wind chill of 53 below zero. Good Lord, that's cold. <laughs> the only other alternative transporting beer in a heated truck is enough to make even a casual beer drinker gag. <laughs> but until the cold subsides, Matt Madigan said the only way for a beer to get delivered. In Minnesota, the temperatures, yeah, it was just nasty. And there's a few distributors that have heated trucks, he said, but there's not many. You tend not to need heated trucks for a reason. <laughs> God, I wonder how cold it is up in Rhode Island. Oh, it's pretty bad. And on a sad occasion, I'm a gremlin lover. Well, aren't we all? Yeah, well, you know how bad of a gremlin lover I am. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we are sad to say... Well, first of all, there is going to be a Gremlins 3. That's a good positive note, but they're sad to say that Dick Miller will not be part of Gremlins 3. He has passed away today at the age of 90. If anybody remember Dick Miller, he played as Mr. Murray, the neighbor, the, the neighbor with his poor satellite. No, he's the one with the leg lamp. Oh, the one... No, oh, wait, no, no, no. no. Oh, he's the one that had the Gremlins inside the... Uh, um, the tractor, yeah, that went See, to his house. Yeah. yeah, and they had the little set, the little antenna on top of the house got destroyed because yeah. he was trying to figure out what was wrong with the TV. Yeah, they were up there bending it and twisting it in all different directions. Yeah, I'm, okay. Yeah, and he was like nuts afterwards, and they ended up going to New York in the part two. Yeah, and, they, and he got figured out how to figure out how to get inside the building with the little elevator. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. He was a good character. He also played in Terminator. Oh, okay. He played in several good movies. Hmm. Well, we got a lot of good movies that are going to be starting to uh, come out. Let's see. Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, 
Ernie Hudson, Sigourney Weaver, they are coming back for Ghostbusters 3. Oh, Lord. Oh, I can't wait. That's well, Jeff be awesome. Foxworthy better not talk to his wife about her meatloaf then. I don't, huh? You don't get the joke? You no. don't remember the joke? No, I don't. Where, I don't forgot what movie it was, but he went, him and his wife went to go. Uh, oh, yeah. I bet Sigourney <laughs> Weaver can go ahead and cook your meatloaf. But, yeah, okay. Yeah, get I the meatloaf that. joke, yeah. I remember that. All right, everybody. We are so happy that uh, Fantastic Journey Podcast Season 3 is kicking off tonight with none other. We have another sci-fi uh, ghost hunter. Dustin Parry was born and raised in Rhode Island. He has known and worked with many members of the TAPS team for the better part of 10 years. He has been interested in the paranormal since he was a child. For the last 23 years or so, he has traveled the world actively reaching, re- blah, reaching, <laughs> researching the field. In addition to conducting his own paranormal research, Dustin is the COO of a surgical practice based in New England. He also does a lot of work as a motivational speaker, a Christian lecturer, and when Dustin isn't busy with one of his many jobs or wearing many hats, he enjoys spending time with his wife and his daughter most of all. Dustin is a huge NASCAR fan, music lover, and a pie aficionado. Let's not forget he's also an author. He has penned a few paranormal and motivational books thus far. And of course he has more in the works. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but uh, he also has a little YouTube channel where he has uh, something about, um, what is it, something for a minute or... What are you doing for a minute or something like that? It's really cool. I actually watched one of them today, and it was, uh, oh, have a minute. That's what it was. It was uh, Hug the Monsters, which is really cool. It's interesting. You're looking at me weird. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm picturing Sully. (laughs) No, no, there's no hugging Scully. No, no. It's just interesting about the whole thing. Um, It's just the motivational uh, speaking that he does and he has a lot of um you know devotionals and things like that but let's go ahead and get dustin on the phone here and we'll see uh what he's been up to it's ringing Hey, Dustin, Gavin Kelly here, and Paula Purcell from the Fantastic Journey Podcast. How are you doing this evening? Doing fantastic yourself. Oh, we're freezing our butts off. Yeah. <laughs> Sad yeah, we're in a studio a, with a fleece blanket. Well, you, Much of the same all over, unfortunately, <laughs> I fear. Yeah. Well, well, you got the fleece blanket. I don't have anything. Well, I guess that's your problem. Oh, I see how you are. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, we were sitting here talking about what what is the name of the show that's on uh your your little series that you have on YouTube? Uh Hey Got a Minute. Hey Got a Minute, that's it. I was telling Paula about the uh the one you did today called Hugging a Monster and she's looking at me going, I don't know why I have somebody hugging Scully in my head. <laughs> well, I suppose that works as well. <laughs> yeah. So I was trying to explain to her, I was like, you know, you do a lot of motivational speaking, so this is part of it, and I mean, I liked it, it was pretty cool, but she just sitting here got Scully on the brain, I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> I guess Thanks, because... Yeah, we, we made 60 of those all together, and I've uh, just been trying to rerun them a little bit and get them out there so more and more people see them, you know. So they last, they're actually for like a minute, every video? Um, well, the motivational segment of it, uh, that's the hook of it, is just like a minute long, you know. Okay. Um, but uh, the rest of it, you know, they usually pan out to be about two to three minutes with the uh, pre-production and all that stuff. Yeah, with the intros and everything. Yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, man. Hey, not a problem. I enjoyed it. So... <laughs> Let's see what we got here. It says that you have been uh, interested in the paranormal since you was a child. So I'm assuming that you had an experience when you were a child that kind of got you into the paranormal? Yeah, the whole thing started for me with a shadow figure that I saw back when I was a kid, um, you know, in my childhood bedroom. And uh, I was just around 10 years old or so. But, 
it was just enough to kind of get me interested and uh, want to find out what else was out there. And I uh, just kind of started, you know, reading the uh, the local folklore books and everything. And once I got a little older, I started getting out there looking for these kind of things. And it's been a great journey, man. Very thankful for the incredible path that it put me on and all the different things I've been able to do since then, you know? Yeah, I mean, you've been to a lot, a lot of places. I mean, well, we can't even catch up to how many places you've been. Yeah, I, I get confused, you know, man. It's, uh, I don't know, 20, uh, 25, 27 countries or something, plus all the places here in the States. And uh, so it's a lot of traveling, uh, not a lot of sleep, and uh, most of the places you're, you know, in the dark. So it all starts to look the same, too. So it's very confusing <laughs> after a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how many years have you been working with TAPS? Uh, well, I don't really uh, associate with that crew, really. Um I was with them kind of just doing the show, but I'm kind of a lone wolf, man. I just work by myself or one or two of my buddies here, um, just locally in the Rhode Island area, you know. Um, they were uh, they were a great group of people, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I still enjoy doing the show and stuff with them, but um, I don't really um, do too much with uh, with the home team or anything, you know. But I'll make an appearance at some of their events or whatever and uh, things, but I kind of like to just work uh, just by myself or just one or two people. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. Well, I mean, that's, I guess that's probably the best way to do it, so that way you don't have to worry about stepping over anybody's toes and getting in anybody's way, you know. Yeah, yeah, indeed, man. And a lot of less drama and stuff. You just add too many people into it. Everybody's going to have their thing. It's just too much, man. I'm not into that. I just like to focus on what's going on and kind of be quiet and be aware of the, the areas and the surroundings and see what happens. Well, what made you uh, lead into becoming a motivational speaker? Uh, a lot of that just came out of the fact that, um, you know, there's um, a lot of people that look to you, you know, because you've been on TV and stuff, and uh, they start uh, writing to you and things on social media and Facebook and email and everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's interesting because, you know, the paranormal attracts, you know, all kinds of different people, but I think there's a lot of people that are into it that were, um, you know, kind of just felt like outcasts in the, in the community and stuff mm -hmm. because, they're into stuff that, you know, not a lot of mainstream people talked about, you know, until the shows really hit big, it's kind of a fringe topic. And, um, a lot of people are kind of quietly living their own little way of life and things. And unfortunately, I think it kind of also lends to some people that, you know, are kind of removed from, from social circles and things and they get kind of quiet and some get kind of depressed and everything. And they write to me and they ask me questions and I kind of go back and forth with them. And, um, they just kind of found a, a natural uh, relationship with people and a kinship and, you know, the shared idea of struggle and, and trying to go through this human experience together. And I just felt like yeah, I was given this little platform, so I was going to do the most I could do uh, with it. And that's what I've been continuing to do. So, you know, I travel around, and even when I do my paranormal lectures and everything, like I always put some motivational stuff in there for people. And uh, I do a great deal of Christmas lectures and stuff, too, because uh, I think the holidays, as much as I love them, can be a very difficult time for people. And I try to do some work for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I do everything I can to, to try to just kind of bring everybody together and, and keep everybody moving forward, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because life can be very difficult. And uh, I think that we need sometimes people to look out for us and people to, to talk with us and to listen to us. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And it also ties into being a Christian lecturer as well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, man. Uh, a lot of people, like, gave me a hard time about that uh, out of all the things that I do. Really? Um, yeah, because it, it's weird, you know, and it, I'm always very thankful to go do the events and everything and then to meet people and then get invited places. And sometimes I'd go and then I'd be standing there, you know, behind my table, mm -hmm. you know, have a, a modest little line or whatever, and somebody would be waiting there and they come up and you know, I'd give them the same hello and greeting like I do everybody else and, mm -hmm. uh, They'll tell me how uh, they pray for me because they can't believe that a Christian could ever work in this field and oh do this God. kind of stuff. And why don't I know everything's demonic? And I was like, oh, <laughs> Lord. And, I said, and then I always just say, listen, you pray for me, I'll pray for you. And, and right? I think that, you know, at some point that's all that matters, you know, and um, there's going to be differences of opinion and understanding. But I think if you if you read the Bible and, uh, and you know, actually look at a lot of the stuff, there's a lot of stuff in there about the spiritual world, you know, mm -hmm. Plenty of stuff in there about angels and demons and things, but um, uh, you know. I, and at the same time, I just got to pray for them because they just know what they know, and they know their interpretation just like I know mine. Um, and I've experienced enough to know that it's not all horrible stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, that that we are are blessed to be able to communicate with the spirit world from time to time. And 
Um, so I, I just do what I do, man. I don't, I don't worry too much about it. I, I get a little flack for it every once in a while, but um, I don't let it stop me from what I'm doing. I love doing my Christian lectures. I love going out to churches and stuff and, uh, and talking about faith and uh, the ideas about, you know, mercy and forgiveness and everything and how important all that is. And mm-hmm. um, I do a great little lecture about the Holy Spirit and, and guidance and everything, because I, I think we're, if we tune into it, man, if we tune into it, we're guided by Spirit, and I think that's very important. Yeah, I agree with that. Every time whenever we do our Ghostology 101 seminar at public libraries, we always have those few people that comes in and says, you know, what you guys do is against God and and <clears throat> this and that. What do you look at? What do you say? No. You got something to say? No. You sure? Yeah. You're agreeing? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they say that, you know, what we do is, is against God. And, and his and his uh, laws and all that stuff and I'm like what no there's like you know you guys are dealing with demons I'm like no they're not demons they're they're just unrested spirits that are still here well it doesn't say anything like that in the Bible I'm like uh, look at Paul and Paul or yes it does <laughs> yeah man I, that's what I always try to tell them too I'm like you know Christ actually gave us um, the command to to charge on his name and to use his name and if we're encountering evil and things mm-hmm. like that you know and I mean that's that's all in there, and, and and thankfully, I mean you know, ninety nine percent of the time, like what you come across, if you come across anything, you know, is usually just it's residual energy. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it, you do have an intelligent intelligent spirit, but they're usually very, you know, just docile and just interested in, in communicating back and forth. And if you do get something negative, it's usually just you know somebody who passed away who just have a negative personality as well you know i'm i'm not one of those people that jumps on the demon card i'm not one of those <laughs> people that think that anything's actually ever trapped here i think right. some kind of move back and forth i think that some visit i think maybe some linger a little bit longer mm-hmm. but i always say that you know a loving deity however you perceive him or her it doesn't have a lock on the gates of the afterlife and says no you can come in you can't come in and i think some of us just you know, we want to check in on our loved ones and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, sometimes, you know, even with the objects and stuff, you know, I think that they're like little touchstones, you know, little things that we left a lot of energy on, our mark on. And we check in from time to time, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just our perception of it. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, because of a lot of the things that are put out there, between uh, media, social media, television, movies, people think everything has to be negative, everything has to be horrible, everybody's trapped, everybody's in pain, everything's yep. a demon, and God's angry at you for looking at it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hollywood basically destroyed it for everybody. Everybody thinks that, you know, ghosts are going to be looking all weird, looking with sunken uh, eye, eye holes and fangs and all that stuff. I mean, they just really destroyed it. So you got a lot of these diehard Ghost Hunter fans who are like, yeah, I want, I want, I want to see a ghost. I want to see this clown come at me or something. It's like, you're not going to see that. You're probably not going to see a translucent anything either you're just going to see a shadow you might see balls of light you're not going to see what you see on on yeah, movies it's, it's very rare that you get anything you know of, of that nature and i right. always just tell people like listen if you're coming out uh to a to an event you know to a, a guest investigation event um, specifically just be there and enjoy the time that you're there you know okay. check out the building think about the history interact with the people that are there you know, learn from the people that are there and Mm -hmm. and a lot of friendships and stuff get formed at these things. Like, enjoy your time. Enjoy your moment. Don't just be sitting there, you know, with bated breath waiting for something that more than likely is not going to happen. Just enjoy the whole feel of it. You know, even for private investigators out doing the thing, it's like, you know, if you've done it long enough, you know, most of the time you're just kind of sitting on your butt in the dark and, and waiting to see if anything comes across. But mm-hmm. um, you have to be prepared for the fact that a lot of times you're just going to be hanging out, and that's okay, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's what you got to be prepared for. Yeah, we actually did uh, an investigation with uh, Keith Age and uh, Rick Hayes at the uh, Doss House in uh, Evansville, Indiana, and we had groups. Paula had a group that was like, are we going to see a ghost? I want to see a ghost. I was at the point I was about ready to put a bed sheet over my head and <laughs> run down the hallway to make them happy. <laughs> yeah, they just kept they just kept on and kept on. They're like, I want to see a ghost. I want to see a ghost. Keith Age was yeah, like, Yeah, it's oh, yeah. really difficult, man, for sure. And like you, you try to tell people, like, listen, your expectations can't be that coming in. If that's the case, and prepare to go home disappointed, you know, but right. um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good that can come out of it if you're willing to, to invest the time, and mm-hmm. I think what's really nice about it, too, is the fact that, I mean, people were spoiled with the TV shows, because they see these things, and they think, oh, like, this is, you know, this is 
happens all the time. It's like, no, you see a highlight reel. Like, you see the best of what happened over three nights. Right. You know, they make us wear the same clothes and all the sudden stuff, but we're there for three nights. Like, it, it's it's sometimes nothing happens. You mm-hmm. don't see an episode at all. Um, but what's nice about it is all those times where nothing happens, um, you learn and you spend time, and then when something does happen, I think it, you really appreciate it a heck of a lot more. Yeah, I mean, that's the reason why we went ahead and came out with our show, The um, Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. Basically, what we do is we get 24 hours to investigate a location, and if we don't get anything, no big deal. We'll just dwell on the history. We'll dwell on the uh, the interviews, so that way the viewer is actually learning more about the location, learning more about the history and the tragedies. And then, of course, they're thinking in the back of their head that, hey, you know, they didn't get anything. Well, maybe if my team goes there, then maybe we might get something. You know? Yeah, it's all about just paying attention and looking for different cues and trying to, you know, do different things. And mm-hmm. that's one of the things I, feel, I always kind of get frustrated with because everyone just does the same stuff, same stuff, same stuff. It's like, listen, there's some cool, you know, theories that are out there. And, yeah, you can try that for sure. But you know, don't don't be afraid to step outside and, and, and color outside the lines once in a while and try your own thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people, people, you know, the first time you do something, it may not work or whatever, second, third time, and people might start, you know, kind of, you know, making fun of you for it or whatever. But if you believe that you've got something, you might as well give it a shot. Yeah. I mean, none of this is proven. That's why every time I hear the term paranormal expert or something, I'm like, really? <laughs> I cringe. Come on, kids. Like, it's, it's, we're all just trying to learn. We're all just mm-hmm. experimenting. And it's yep. cool when we find stuff that works, but don't be afraid to try new things. Yeah, I, I always cringe when someone says they're a paranormal uh, expert or a professional. I'm like, dude, no, you're not. Um, <laughs> how can you be a professional with something that hasn't even been proven? I mean... No, it's not going to work that way. I mean, we're all students. We're constantly learning. Every time we go to a location, we're learning more about the location. We're learning more about the history. We're learning more about what is there and if we can communicate with it so we can learn even more. I mean, when we go and start talking to spirits, we're like, we're not here to infringe. We're not here to uh, upset you. We're just here to ask you questions because we want to learn about you. You know. I think the most important thing that we can always try to do is I always tell people, like, if you're, if you're out there and you're trying to have a communication session, whatever you're using, if you're just using a recorder or a ghost box or, mm-hmm. or, or whatever you choose to use, whatever works for you that you like, just take a more cerebral approach to it. Don't just keep doing the same stock questions all the time. Think right. about if you know who that person is that's supposed to be there, mm-hmm. what would they want to talk about? What kind of things were they passionate about? Who was it that was in their life? What kind of things did they do? You know, ask those kind of things and try to get them to come forward and, and to be a part of the conversation. And if nothing's going on, I've always found the best way to do it is to just have conversation with who you're with and just hang out like normal. And you'd be surprised how many times they jump in or mm-hmm. they just like all of a sudden let themselves be known. Like you create a nice, positive and fun environment and people want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And if you sit there and you just keep peppering people with questions, nobody wants that. Right. Yep. I agree with that. Usually when we're asking questions, we're basically trying to talk to whoever it is, like just holding a regular conversation. Or like you just said, I mean, there were times that we would actually talk amongst us, and all of a sudden there was one question I said at Ashmore Estates. I was like, so, is there anybody here that wants to talk to us? And then just out of thin air you hear a nope, and it wasn't any of us. Yeah. <laughs> Like, wow. That's it, man. They they look for their chances to to be a part of it if they want to, you know. And yeah. they interject when they want to, and and that's the, I think really the best way to go about it, you know. Just you put out the the general kind of vibe in the beginning. You let them know, hey, like you know, we're here, we're open to communication, we're going to be hanging out, and and then just see how it develops. Like, yeah, you can ask a couple of questions here and there, but just just waiting, you know, thirty seconds to forty seconds to ask your question after somebody else asks their question. Mm-hmm. It just seems kinda of asinine, man. It's just oh, yeah. played out and it's routine and it's dull. Yeah. Usually what we'll try to do is go into a location, walk around it, and uh, just let them get used to us. That we're not coming in, you know, to be hostile or anything. We're just coming in to like look at the building, say, Hey man, you know, this building is beautiful, it's nice. Um, I love what the owners are doing to it, you know, just kind of build up the morale of walking around so that whatever is there, you know, they're like basically, you know, hey, this person's pretty cool. I might want to talk to them later or something, you know, get them more comfortable with us. One of my favorite things to do, um, and we can never do another show because of uh, 
um, copyright and all that kind of thing. But Mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to do was always just to sit and play music for a while. And I find that you play music that ties into the time of, you know, when that person lived Mm -hmm. um, and kind of just create like a a familiar vibe, you know, and uh, you put that out there and, you know, you put out some devices and stuff and then, you know, it doesn't take too long. You start to see things start to happen. Um, and music for me has always been so important in my life since I was a kid. I've always loved music. I've always liked writing lyrics and things and, mm-hmm. and playing music. And I think it's uh, a nice way to connect um, memories and convey emotion. And I think that the other side um, still responds to that, you know. And so I find that a lot of times I'll sit and I'll just play music for a while and, you know, try different things and and see what works, you know. And, and it's interesting because then all of a sudden you start getting – interaction with some of the devices you start hearing different things or you see movement and stuff it's like you're 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 connecting with them on, on, a, on a different level uh than what is normally done mm-hmm. yeah we've done that at several times i did not necessarily music but i took the atmosphere of what we were at and i played on it and like for instance we were at an all-girls catholic school that uh had some stories behind it, and a Latin and German was a very common language barrier in that school. So what I did is I took a lot of Latin prayers and a lot of German association in, like, not necessarily singing, but as in chants, like they had a lot of some German chants and, and poems and stuff, and I played those through and warming up the environment to get used to the what's happening and then I, we end up getting responses back afterwards in german too yeah in german when we did the um the international show um you know we, we traveled and we were in different lands all over the place and a lot of times people would watch the show and they'd say you know you guys went all the way there and you never even tried speaking that language and they never really showed it um because we did a real horrible job at at doing it and also they would have to then subtitle everything that we did mm-hmm. um, but there were a couple of DVD extras and stuff where they did show it and a lot of times we, we spoke not just the languages of uh, the day in these lands uh, but we took the time to get some of our questions translated into some of the older languages that were spoken there. A lot of times you're in you know these beautiful castles and things and uh, people of nobility would speak you know two or three different languages mm-hmm. so we would try a little Latin, we would try a little German, um, you know we, we all kind had our own little niche of uh, a language we could speak at least a little bit of and Mm -hmm. uh, you know i I use a lot of spanish in different places and there were times where you know just like universal consciousness theory speaks to where you're not limited to the linguistic skills and understandings of this life when you pass on you tap into something bigger and there i am you know doing the investigation and i I ask questions in english and i get proper responses in spanish i ask Mm -hmm. in spanish and i get a proper response back in english and i think what is nice about it is it's not that they don't understand if we're speaking our language because all are one at the end of the day, but I think by making the effort to try to speak the language they were most familiar with when they lived, that mm-hmm. they were most comfortable with, I think what you're doing there is showing them a sign of respect and you're showing them that, listen, I'm, I'm trying to make this effort to make this as comfortable as possible for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's when they really start to come forward more. And um, it really is, um, it really is a, a nice thing when it, when it comes together. Even over in the in the states recently, you know, I did a couple of cases over um, at uh, Malvern Manor, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I had a great back and forth uh, in, in Spanish uh, with one of the spirits there, and it was amazing because I, I don't I don't normally speak Spanish very much, so um, it was kind of fun to to utilize it um, again, as, as limited as I am with it. Um, I was able to get a lot of, of response with it. So it's um, it's just, you know, another technique, you know, just being more thoughtful, being, um, a, you know, of a sound mind and, and, and a helpful mind. Mm-hmm. Where you're like, listen, I want to try to talk to you. I want to try to talk to you about things you want to talk about. I want to try to talk in a language that you're familiar with first and, uh, and try to bridge that gap. Yeah, that ma- it makes a lot of sense. Malvern Manor is where Paula got scratched. That was an inter- yeah. interesting thing. Uh, you heard the story about Hank, right? Uh, which one's Hank? He, he's the one that taunts and despises women. Yeah, they don't like. Um, he doesn't like oh, weed yeah. male investigators. Yeah, he doesn't like. Yeah, them. yeah. I remember up there in his room for a little bit over there. Um, 
And uh, what's the other one? There's another one there, too. Uh, the, is it the captain? The captain, yeah. Uh, the captain, yeah. Uh, it's a weird place because it's um, Melbourne Manor is a beautiful place, and Josh Hurd does a really good job taking care of it there. And um, it's interesting because it was such a mixed-use facility. You know, like some places we go, it's like this was a tuberculosis center. It was always a tuberculosis center. So that's all you're going to get. You know, you're going to just deal with these kind of things. But uh, a place like that, where it was, you know, kind of. It was like a, like a little halfway house for everybody, you know, and people mm-hmm. passing through town and, like, people that lived there. And, like, there's so many different people that came and went for different times and then, you know, people that were taken care of, you know, in the nursing home. It, it, it was a little bit of everything. So I think mm-hmm. that's one of the charms about it is because there's so many different spirits and so many different levels that can touch base there and check in at any time. Yeah, that's true. How, how did you uh, feel up in the attic? Um, the, you know, the attic space never really does anything for me there, and and it's uh, I mean it's small and kind of cramped, so I don't really spend a lot of time up there because I'm just physically not comfortable, mm-hmm. uh, just due to, to to the size of uh, of the attic space there. Uh, but you know, I, I did spend some time that that uh, I've investigated it twice, mm-hmm. um, and I, and I have spent time in there, um, but you know, nothing has, has ever kind of showed itself or interacted with me in that area. Um, I mostly do well. Um, and, and not with it down on the first floor there, you know, they have that area where they say that, you know, where the nursing home part was that that, uh, that uh, figure, the, the dark shadow of like the man that runs out of the room with people there. Mm-hmm. I've never seen that, but I've had great communication sessions in that hallway. And then uh, upstairs, outside the captain's room over there, um, mm-hmm. lots of back and forth and uh, even physical, you know, uh, like uh, prodding and, and touching on the back and stuff there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but nothing that was of, you know, that I felt was of a negative. Uh, type thing. It's kind of weird. I don't get a lot of negative activity, and I think it's just because I don't have that vibe. Right. Um, I, I'm always a very positive person. I'm always coming from a place with kindness and love. And you know, once in a while, you still get like a get out thing or whatever, which is just it's so hokey at this point. It's played out. But um, but for the most part, I always get really. I, I usually get women and children um, mostly uh, communicating with me. Um, I don't do very well like with the prisons and all the alpha male types and everything. Like they just. We just don't seem to communicate. Um, but um, kids and, and women seem to talk to me quite a bit mm-hmm. at uh, the various locations that I've gone to. And so that's something that I always kind of focus on. If I know there's supposed to be you know, someone like that there, I was like, well, that's probably my best chance um, to communicate with somebody. So I try to hone in on that. Yeah, the, the weird thing is that happened to us over at uh, Malvern Manor is Shadow Hallway. Um, yeah. Rick Rose went ahead and told us he goes what, what you need to do is go down to Shadow Hallway go to the nurse's station and yep. uh, basically shout code blue, code blue code blue and he said usually what will happen is somebody will come running down the hall to a room just to see if I guess if someone's okay so Paula went ahead and tried it um, she's like, code blue, code blue, we have a code blue. And all of a sudden, you can see the shadow go right down the hallway, right past her. It kind of like pushed her off her feet into me. And that was just, that totally blew our minds. I mean, to actually watch the footage and you see that shadow just zooming on down the hall after she said code blue, code blue. That was freaky. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, man, for sure. It's it's a, it's an interesting place. It's, oh, yeah. It's, um, yeah, you know, but I, I really appreciate uh, Josh and and uh, and all that he's done to to keep that place going, mm-hmm. um, the renovation efforts and everything else. And uh, I think it's a it's it's a nice place. It's very colorful. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a and like I said, because of its mixed use background, I think it's a good place for investigators to go because there's layers of activity there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that kind of heightens your chance to get something going on. Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, let's see. Have you a uh... Have you ever experienced anything, um, you know, negative, something that basically either scratched you, slapped you, hurt you in any way while you've been? No, not really, man. The only thing that ever happened with me was um, over in um, Ireland when I was at Lep. Someone me down over there. But at the time, like, I don't think it was anything negative or anything. I think it's just my approach um, to investigating at the time was um was just not what it is today you know mm-hmm. i wasn't very thoughtful i wasn't very um responsible um, i just um 
I didn't go about it in in the way that I, I I'm I prefer to nowadays, you know. And I think at the time it was just something that was trying to show me, like, hey, listen, like, stop clowning around here, like, you know, this 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 is a very serious thing, mm-hmm. and uh, and I, I was thankful for it because. It really made me realize, like, yeah, there's there's a lot more to this than, than what I thought originally. You know, there's a lot more going on, and so uh, I try to focus on that now, and uh, so I'm very thankful for that. But mm-hmm. I don't think there was anything uh, negative tied to it. I think it was just trying to kind of prove a point to me, mm-hmm. um, and which was well taken. And then you know, from that point on, I've really kind of changed the way that I do things, um, right. and uh, and and all in a very positive way. So since then, everything's been really good, and I. But other than that, I mean, even, you know, prior to that point, I never really had much uh, happen in a negative way at all. And I hear all these stories, and I start to wonder sometimes, too, because I think about different theories, and I, I really think a lot of times that it's the um, it's what people go in looking for. Right. You know, I think, I think people are attracting that type of activity, if not manifesting it themselves, because in their head, that's what they want to happen. Right. I want to see this. I want this to happen. I want that to happen. Like, they have all these preconceived notions. And I think that at some point, they, um, that's all they're going to find, if they find anything, mm-hmm. if they're not creating it themselves. Hmm. I agree with that to an extent, but check this out. We went to a place called the Industrial Slaughterhouse, and it's in Fancy Farm, Kentucky. Um, come to find out, two girls from Talon Falls went ahead and were practicing witchcraft. Now, this is really deep for us the most darkest investigation we've ever done. And they basically conjured something. And I'm I'm thinking to myself that they don't know what the heck they conjured, but there's something there. And it's, it is of an evil presence. Um, because I wound up getting clawed in the face. I had bloody fingertips. My camera guy said that um, he felt like something reached into his back and started pulling his life away, and he started seeing, you know, uh, his memories just flashing before his eyes before he ran out of there. Um, The one thing that really got me is we were getting five-inch deep weld sockets thrown at us inside the mechanical room. I don't know, man. Like like I said, I never come across anything like that, you know? And it's just interesting to me because I hear stories about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I see pictures and, and videos and things, but um, I never come across anything like that, you know? And, and I know a lot of people that work with witchcraft and stuff, and, mm-hmm. you know, just what they do is it doesn't have to be anything bad that comes along with it. It's just mm-hmm. like anything else. You know, people give witchcraft and Ouija boards and all these things, like, such a bad rap just right. because of, you know, some of the notions that go along with it. But, you know, if if... If you are doing anything with that type of intent to bring something um, or, or look for something that's negative, I think that you're heightening your chances of finding it. You mm-hmm. know, so like people that sit and use a Ouija board, you know, just for for spirit communication, it can be used as, as safely as any EVP recorder or K2 device or anything else that people use. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, a lot of people hear it, and you know, they just they know the name. And they know what they've seen on TV, and they know right. what they've seen in movies, and instantly this has to, you've summoned a demon, you've done this and that. Mm-hmm. It's like, listen, like it doesn't have to go that way either, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's always unfortunate when, when those kind of things happen, and it's, it's frustrating for me, you know, as, as someone who's been in the field for a long time, and I can respect people's different understandings and opinions of things and stuff, um, but when you go out with people who've never investigated before, and that's what they're expecting. That's what they're mm-hmm. looking for, and that's their mindset right off the bat. It's like, no, no, no. It's like, you know, like you need to really kind of open your mind up about these things, you know. And I think that the beauty of of investigating is having that opportunity um, to to touch the other side, almost, you mm-hmm. know. And I think that more people need to be thoughtful of that part of it mm-hmm. instead of just like, well, I saw this, so this must mean this, because there's so much good that's out there and. I think the interaction that you can have sometimes can really be life-altering in such a wonderful way. Right, right. Yep. The one thing that was kind of blew our minds is um, I wound up talking to a pagan priest, and he was telling me what we need to look for when I told him the story about the two uh, women that are practicing witchcraft. And sure enough, when we went back into the slaughterhouse, we found two hex bags we found uh, a talisman. We also found a vase with weird writing on it. 
and also an old uh, chest with uh, a dated or period uh, outfit in it. And when we went ahead... Yeah, man, you, you never know what people put in places, too. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the things. Like, a lot of these places that are open, like, people bring stuff in all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's really crazy. Yeah, but we went ahead and uh, put it all into a big, huge pile, and we burned it. The only thing is, is it refused to burn. It wouldn't burn. So we kept dousing it and dousing it with lighter fluid and, and stuff, and it just would not burn. It took at least, well, how long to take? A couple, like an hour or so? Yeah. It took about an hour for it to finally burn. It just would yeah, not I know, burn. I um, know a lot of times when, if I can, I talk to John Zaffis a lot about these kind of things if we come across them in mm -hmm. a home case or something yeah. um, that we do. And, you know, John says a lot of times that, you know, um, depending on what they are, um, you know, sometimes it, he often just takes to burying a lot of the things too. Um, you know, between blessings and bindings and all these different things, there's a lot of different ways that people go about it for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but there's, uh, it's always interesting. Like, you know, you never know what you're going to find in some of these places. Oh, yeah. Um, I was, I was doing a home case recently, um, with, uh, my friend Cody up here and, you know, we were crawling around, like trying to find the source of what was going on in the house because it didn't add up story wise. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was the same kind of thing. Like, you know, we just start going to a little crawl space and you open a little thing that looked like it was sealed up and you find some stuff in there. And, um, a lot of times, you know, you take those, those things out of there and, and uh, dispose of them, and then the activity calms down or, or dies down for the people. Yep. <clears throat> so, um, but it's um, it's unfortunate that there there's so much that's out there that you know people really mess around with that uh, mm -hmm. they don't have uh, knowledge, uh, full knowledge of, that they don't have respect for. Exactly, and it also ruins it for a lot of people that are just trying to actually just have a cool collective investigation, and then they wind up getting hurt. And they're right. Yes. Yep. No, it's uh, it's one of those things that people just, you know, it's and you know, I always try to tell people too because I do a lot of, you know, I, thankful I get to do a lot of lectures and get to travel and go to a lot of different places and mm -hmm. and speak to a lot of people and and uh, I'm all for people experiencing um, the spirit world and looking further into it, but it has to be done, you know, in a respectful nature and a safe nature and you know, a lot of times you get people that go into places that um, that they really shouldn't be going into. You know, you shouldn't be going into places that, you know, that are uh, that are abandoned, um, that are, you know, locked away on private property. And right. People are, you know, get, get involved in these things and they, they don't realize. Like, a lot of these buildings are just, you know, they're structurally unsound. And right. um, every, you know, October comes around and you see a lot of, you know, um, amateur, you know, ghost hunters or whatever they want to call them that are interested in this stuff. And, um, you know, they, they get hurt. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, people even lose their lives, you know, falling yep. through floors or down stairwells. And yep. um, it's it's one of those things where it's it's can be such a blessing, but if you don't do it the right way, it can be very dangerous. And it doesn't mean dangerous in the way of, you know, spiritually dangerous, although that's also, uh, you know, potential, just physically dangerous. It's just... Um, and you don't, the whole thing really gets to me too, because like, people, you know, always, oh, I gotta wait till it's dark out. I gotta wait till it's midnight. I gotta wait till it's, you don't have to wait for anything. Right. The spirit world is always around. It's not like they like, they don't wake up until the sun goes down. Like, right. It's, yeah. um, it's very frustrating on that level too. You know, and I get it for TV, like they want certain things or whatever. And there's certain theories about being able to see things easier against a darkened background. I can appreciate all that, mm -hmm. but let's not, you know, forget the fact that people see apparitions in broad daylight. They interact with them and think they're actual people and that there's always opportunity for communication. If you're being quiet and you're looking for it, but our world is so hurried. It's so busy. It's so mm -hmm. noisy that yeah. we miss these things quite easily. I mean, we miss we miss conversation with the people that are actually living in our lives, never mind people that have passed on. And True. that's the thing I think that frustrates me the most is that we're missing our time together with people um, because of all the challenges that we have in this life. And, uh, you know, one of the key things I always tell people is don't don't wait to try to talk to somebody, you know, until they've passed away. Like, you know, people, they'll write to me like, oh, you know, my grandmother passed away. Do you think I should try to communicate with her? Do you and, I, I don't. I really don't. I think if if grandma wants you to know she's around, she'll let you know. Yep. Um, but, you know, did did you call your other grandmother that's still alive and talk to her? Because that's easy. Mm -hmm. You can just go over there, you know? But people don't think about that. No. But think about it when it's the last minute, last moment. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people that keep going to locations that, you know, where you're not supposed to be trespassing. And they do. They just think that it's a high, it's a thrill. 
and they want to do it and basically they feel like well hey you know, it's a challenge in other words you know they want to go ahead and go into these places trespassing so they can do their investigation and stuff and hope that they don't get hurt i've seen that happen a lot break into places and and they feel that it's okay that that's what really aggravates me that's for sure yeah, and one of the things that really um, bothers me quite a bit is the desecration that happens at um, at cemeteries and everything. Yes. You know, these are these are these are monuments to to people that that lived and breathed and worked and lived and and, and died, and their memory is there. It doesn't mean they are there. Um, yeah, there's activity sometimes that happens in in cemeteries and stuff for sure, just like anywhere else. Um, but the idea that you know everybody who passed away. It's just standing there over their corpse waiting for you to come talk to them is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so when I see people walking around the graveyards and, and doing all this stuff and, and causing all these problems, it gets very frustrating. Like I, and, um, you know, like I, I go there a lot just to walk. I, I love a nice walk to the cemetery. I like to relax. I put my music on and I just kind of relax and chill out. And, um, you know, but, you know, I go with my family sometimes. My daughter comes with me and we, we take turns, like, you know, cleaning off the flat stones and everything and mm -hmm. straightening up the flags and those kind of things. And it's a nice way to learn about history, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been interested in reading, you know, the old epitaphs and, and uh, just seeing what's out there, the different stone design and everything. It's it's a facet of the paranormal for sure. You know, there's something about it that is related, that we all kind of like, that we're all kind of into in, in some way, I think, some more than others, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really bothers me when I see that, you know, there's stories of, of people that go in there, um, you know, with ill intent and uh, and cause, you know, harm to these these beautiful old stones and stuff, these slate things and stuff that people snap. Like, you, they... Uh, they can't be repaired and, and never be quite as they once were. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. they can refurbish them a little bit and stuff, but um, I love to see the old ornate little carvings and things on these. Um, and it's really cool, like the depictions of like angels and skulls and all this stuff. It's like classic Halloween, mm -hmm. you know, style decor. And it's so awesome. And it's a great little part of, of our paranormal world and our paranormal lives. And I've always had great respect for people that I see that go in there and fundraise to kind of fix these broken things and everything because it's a, it's a great piece of history. And you can't forget that all those people that are there, they all went through the same struggles that we go through today and then some. Um, and uh, it's it's nice way to kind of to, to pay homage and to be thoughtful about our whole human experience that we all share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. In all the locations that you have been to, which one sticks out more in your mind? Like you always talk about it because you had a memorable experience there. No, one of my favorites, man, was uh, I mean, I, I've got a couple for sure, but. Um, St. Augustine Lighthouse down in Florida will always be a very, very special place for me, you know, and I get to go there and uh, I think it was season two of Ghost Hunters mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we heard this woman's voice when we were there and we get to see, you know, her image. I was with Brian around the stairwell. We get to see her walking, pacing around the top and to see that, that was the first time I had seen, you know, an apparition since the, the shadow figure from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and, and it just brought it all back home, you know. And I mean, the years of, of reading books um, about this kind of stuff and trying to learn about how to communicate, how to possibly, you know, touch the other side and traveling around and going from place to place and setting up equipment, breaking down equipment, reviewing evidence, and mm -hmm. finally seeing that, it just was everything, you know. And I remember just freezing, like, I don't even know what to do at this point. Like, I'm just, I'm just completely, like, stunned and in awe that this is right there and it's real and it's 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 almost tangible i can almost you know like reach out to it and it's it's everything i wanted it to be you know all those years of of wondering like you know, did i really see that when i was a kid like you start to doubt yourself you start to wonder right. and you can know that yeah this stuff is really out there that's why you know when people say i want to see a ghost i want to see a ghost i get it i totally get it i want to see one too but I've done it long enough to know that chances are you're not going to. Right. But when that time comes, if that time comes for you, it's going to be everything you want it to be. And in that moment at St. Augustine will always be so special for me because of that. And I've been back there, you know, at least, I don't know, seven or eight times doing events and stuff since then. And I've, I've never, ever seen her again. 
Um, I have seen some some shadowy things down in the basement, uh, the, down in the ground floor area. Mm-hmm. Um, get a lot of EVPs and stuff in a, in a very heavy Spanish dialect that ties in with the original founding of that area. <clears throat> so that's that's all really good. Um, but that's always going to be a favorite. And then you know overseas, and I get um, great opportunities to go to so many like, chateaus and old hospitals and mansions and all these things and castles. Mm-hmm. But out of them all, the um, Clark Air Force Base over in the Philippines. Oh wow! That place was very interesting, man, because it was, you know, it was an outpost for our American soldiers during the Vietnam War, and uh, afterwards, um, it stayed on as a hospital for a while, and then kind of fell into this, you know, disrepair. It wasn't it was abandoned. Mm-hmm. Um, but our our client, the gentleman that you know told us the stories and, and brought us around the place. Um, he was a security guard there um, for many, many years, and then he stayed on as a security guard afterwards, kind of guarding the building until they just kind of said, you know, we're not going to do anything with it anymore. And he would tell people the stories. You know, he would tell people, listen, I've seen this weird, you know, milky white apparition walking around in, in the, the lower areas. I've heard hmm. American soldiers, I've heard their voices in English, you know, yelling out for things. And um, that place, the, the nights that we spent there, it was remarkable because mostly when we go and we spend two, three nights at a place, mm-hmm. um, either nothing ever happens on any of the nights or one night is fantastic and the other nights are awful. Um, it's very rare that you get a place that is active every night. And um, that was the, the Clark Air Force Base. And, and it's the only place I've ever been where the laundry list given to us, you know, by the client of, you know, I see this and I'm here that and mm-hmm. I go over there and this happens. Everything this gentleman said that he experienced, everything that he witnessed, we witnessed. Everything that he heard, we heard, we recorded. And then when I finally sat with him and we played it back for him, Mm -hmm. he was just stunned. And he was silent, and then he started just sobbing. And we ended up, like, cutting the cameras and just sitting and talking with him for a little bit. And he was just so thankful because he had become kind of like a laughing stock of the town. Like people said he was a drunk. People said he was crazy. And, you know, none of this stuff actually happened. Mm-hmm. And yet we were able to, to not only say, yeah, man, we, we saw it. We heard it. But we were able to say, here it is. You know, here's our recordings of it. And um, it was really just a nice feeling all around. You know, it was it was very remarkable for its paranormal activity mm-hmm. um, but on a personal level to bring somebody that peace and understanding, I think, was really the most important part of it all. Yeah. When you were talking about St. Augustine, did you see her with the naked eye or through infrared or through thermal? No, we could, we could see her just with the thing on the um, I had a mini DV camera um, oh. with me at the time, uh-huh. and um, the IR had died on the top of it. And so through the camera lens, you can just see this gray blur going back and forth in the stairwell just uh, above where we were. Um, but just with the naked eye, you could see you could see the pleats in the dress. You could see the curls in her hair. Wow. It was just looking like, you know, you're staring at a semi-transparent woman walking back and forth and um, and, and responsive. Uh, not just, not just, you know, like it was some type of uh, residual activity, responsive, because Brian had asked if she could come down a level, and she did. Oh, and wow. we'd say hi, and she'd say hi, and then it just, she just turns into this ball of light and goes right into the side of the building, gone. And wow. it was just, it was unlike anything I've ever seen, and, and I've never seen anything quite as detailed since um, on, on a case. And it's just been... Um, yeah, it's you know, for want of a better term, she still haunts my memory because yeah. I, it was it was that profound, you know. And it was it was that once in a lifetime moment, and um, it just came at the right time when I really needed a little reassurance that I was doing the right thing here. And right. it, um, I still think about it. Hmm. One thing that kind of gets me: we've been hearing a lot of stories from different investigators, and of course, you know, there's some legends uh, stories as well where they're actually seeing um, an apparition that is solid. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm still you know, on the fence I've, with that. I've, I haven't come across that, but I remember doing a case down in Australia mm-hmm. where um, the, uh, the tour guide had told us that they had several people um, report, you know, interacting and talking to this person that they thought works there. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and they said it looked like an absolute, you know, solid figure. Like you, you couldn't see through them or anything else. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I was, I was in, um, I was in New Zealand once, and I remember talking to someone, and we were discussing um, 
we're discussing string theory and all these ideas and they get into, you know, we talk about time flips, we talk about this, we talk about that. Mm-hmm. And we get into string theory and then uh, I get to be quite honest, it was it was way above like what I was thinking at the time. I was trying to figure out what the heck they were talking about. Mm-hmm. And then they put it in a term where I could, I could really understand. And they said, picture like, picture a big loaf of bread and picture each slice of that bread as its own moment in its own place in time. And then for whatever reason, whatever forces that we don't understand, something squishes that loaf of bread together, pushing each slice onto another. So they're almost becoming one for that moment in time. Right. Maybe that's what's happening. And maybe sometimes it happens just a little bit. And so we only see the transparent other side. And maybe sometimes it's almost concrete together. And that's why there's these time slips where people see like a full you know, legion of, of soldiers walking, you know, through a field or they, mm-hmm. they talk and interact with somebody that is looks and solid human being and then they disappear. Like, you know, where does that stuff happen? Where does it go? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so many other ideas too out there about like, you know, it's it just of, of us even haunting ourselves, like our, our past selves, our future selves, people that occupy the same, you know, the dwelling that we live in in the future or in the past. Mm-hmm. Like, who knows how it really works? And like, that's why when people start talking about these kind of things, I'm like, this to me is much more intriguing than something fell in the basement, and it, I think it's a demon. It's like, right. no, maybe, maybe <laughs> something just fell over in the basement. Maybe something from a different time knocked something over in the basement. Maybe it, you have a cat didn't, didn't knock it over in the basement. But just because you know something happens, it doesn't mean there has to be a demon. But I, for me, I give a lot more credence to some of these other bigger ideas that are out there, because I think that... Um, the whole idea of of, of time slips and, and these kind of things are really interesting to me. You know, there's another thing I get a lot of heat for too as a Christian. Like when it comes down to our reincarnation and stuff, I'm like, I absolutely believe that souls sometimes have to come back. I don't think that we get it right on the first time, nor do I think we're expected to. And right. I think that I think this life is kind of like a training ground for souls. I think we have to go through here and learn to not put ourselves first at some point. I think that we need to learn the bigger picture is looking out for each other and, and, and looking for opportunities to be thoughtful and kind and helpful to each other. And I think when we start to get to that level, then maybe we can finally ascend, you know, when all is said and done. But I think a lot of us, you know, you look around and like, oh, you don't get it yet. I think you're probably going to have to come back. <laughs> I'm not, I don't <laughs> want to be the judge because Lord knows I still make my share of mistakes too, but... I start to think I'm getting it more and more. And Lord knows I'm also tired, so I'd like to think maybe I get a reprieve after this one. Right. But um, I do, and there's some of the stories, man, there's so many remarkable stories of children when they're younger having these incredible memories of, of life's gone by, you know, descriptions of things that they shouldn't have knowledge of that, that they know. Exactly. And yeah, of course, we can always talk about imagination and stuff, but some things are just way too weird, man. There's, <laughs> there's too many ideas and too many concepts, I think, um, to, to totally, you know, just wash that away and say, oh, no, that doesn't happen. I, I really think it does. Yeah, I agree. Well, we're already at the top of the hour here, so we're going to have to take a break here. Uh, you guys are listening to the Fantasmic Journey podcast. I'm your host, Gavin Kelly, and Paula Purcell Kelly is next to me. We'll be right back with our guest, Dustin Parry from uh, Ghost Hunters, and we're going to talk a little bit about past life progression and probably more about the solid apparitions. So stay tuned. Or not. <laughs> oh my god I hate this commercial thing It's not working <laughs> Yeah we've been having issues uh, with, the, with the storm So it kind of loses the server I don't know what the heck's going on But uh, here we go I got it I think <laughs> Maybe maybe not We don't know We'll see Keyboard Cat Hamilton the Pug And Toast Meets World These are some of the internet's Most beloved pets And they all have one thing in common. Their stories started in a shelter. Start your story. Adopt a dog or cat today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Training that pet to play the keyboard, that's optional. Start a story. Adopt a shelter or rescue pet today. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. 
Okay, what are you wearing right now? Nothing. That's right. So mommy's going to teach you how to dress yourself. Underwear always comes first. Name tag at the back, then pants, then shirt. Get the first button in the right hole or you have to start all over. Socks going first, then shoes right on right, left on left. With shoelaces, just take the ends, cross them over, switch the loops. The rabbit goes down the hole, pull tight, and you left with bunny ears. Got it? Why are your pants on your head? Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day, making sure they brush their teeth is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Visit 2 min 2 xorg to find out more. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. How's it going? I'm having a stroke. Are you going to shake my hand? I'm having a stroke. Wow, you're not even moving your arm. I'm having a stroke. When someone is having a stroke, they may not be able to say it with words, but their body language will tell you loud and clear. Look for fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911 immediately. Know the sudden signs. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. The storks are bringing me a baby brother. We can do this. Together. All right, let's go. Storks know how to keep kids safe. Do you? What? Oh, my gosh, you don't know. <gasps> I know. You don't. <laughs> oh, man, you laugh when you're uncomfortable. <laughs> no. Making sure your child is in the right car seat is one of the steps to safer travel. I will rock this. You will rock this. To know for sure that your child is in the right car seat for their age and size, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. Cool, cool, cool. Very cool, very cool. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. Feed the Pig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to start foraging wild berries. I was skeptical, but these are actually pretty good. You don't need to sell your soul to the devil. Fifteen bucks is the best I can do. You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Welcome to Calvin's Barbershop. You all got to see this. I don't even want to know what you're looking at on that phone. Well, you should. I was learning about the dangers of high blood pressure and that we need to get ours checked regularly. High blood pressure can increase the risk of heart attack or stroke, but this text program can help keep it at a healthy range. Just text Barbershop to 97779 to sign up. I'll get right on it as soon as I'm done with this baby panda video. <laughs> text Barbershop to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association and the Hamilton Act. was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat, and I'm doing a downward dog, and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. I do not love him. Hamilton the Pug, Instagram star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. So you see, son, good manners are important. Should I go through it again? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Exactly. Always say please, thank you, you're welcome, and excuse me. Sit up straight, hold doors open, don't speak with your mouth full, keep your elbows off the table. Share your things, play nice, and generally treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Got it? Got it. And stop picking your nose. Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day, making sure they brush their teeth is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Visit 2 min 2 xorg to find out more. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. I'm a retired school psychologist, and helping people was my thing. After my stroke, when Meals on Wheels started, I was on the other end of the stick, so to speak. My name is Julius Gaines, creative writer, poet, photographer. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. 
You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guest to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. And welcome back to the Phantasm Journey podcast. This is our kickoff of season three, and we have an awesome guest with us tonight. He has played in Sci-Fi's Ghost Hunters. It's Dustin Parry. And he is a motivational speaker, a Christian lecturer, a COO at a surgical practice based in New England. And just before we went to break, we were talking about uh, solid apparitions. And uh, I was going to go ahead and tell him one of the stories uh, that we uh, actually experienced. But he was talking to us about... um, an apparition that was actually seen when in New Zealand, was it? Uh, it was actually um, uh, in Australia. Australia. Down at, uh, yeah, down in Australia. But yeah, the conversation that I was talking about was over in uh, New Zealand. Man. And they get all over the place, man. Thankfully, those places at least were close together because they, they flew us everywhere. Hmm. Well, one of the things I was going to go ahead and say, when we started talking about, um, you know, uh, when you were saying about reincarnation and stuff like that and about children saying that they... They realized they were from another time or something like that. Similar to a past life regression. Have you ever done one of those? Um, I've never actually done one. Um, I've had some interesting um, little touch points in my life that kind of gave me some foreshadowing as to where I may have come from, but uh, I've never actually done it. And actually, it's interesting because traveling all the time with uh, with Barry Fitzgerald, um, he mm-hmm. was actually a licensed um, hypnotherapist and such, and he actually would would work with that uh-huh. um, and we've talked about doing it and uh, you know we'd sit down and we'd, we'd discuss it but I never went through with it I'm kind of interesting man I never want to know too much about those kind of things you know I'm kind of right. like I'm focusing on what I'm doing right now and I don't want to know what the future holds and if the past chimes in once in a while that's cool I'm just going to focus on this experience while I'm doing it yeah it was really crazy we had a Mary Barrett she went ahead and put me under and yeah. I actually found out that I died twice <clears throat> and I could actually tell everybody that was watching the environment that I was in, the building structures, the colors, the, the architecture. I could actually name everything and, and if I could draw it, I could probably do an entire mural of where I was. That's how vivid it was when I was doing this past life regression. But yeah, you really don't want to know how many times you died in a past life, but I think it was just amazing to actually be able to to talk about that and actually come out of it and still remember it like you were actually there. Kind of bizarre. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the uh, young lady, a really, really good friend of mine, uh, Jessica uh, Jewett, she she edits all my my books and everything for me, and a very talented young lady, and um, she also does... um, past life readings and um, just it's just everything by phone and stuff and uh, um, it's amazing like some of the stories that she's told me like the, the connection that she's had for so many different people um, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing to see what what makes us all tick and the connection between it all you know and, and that's why I think that you know more people need to be thoughtful of the loftier things and I think that in this life currently uh, we get so tied up with all of the shiny plastic things you know and you know, the, the day jobs that, you know, used to be eight hours, but now run close to 10 hours and you right. have to leave you alone even when you go back home, you know? And, uh, it, it like, you know, even uh, this past fall, when I was not doing my lecture series in the fall, I remember reading a headline uh, that ended up being a part of my lecture throughout the year. And um, the headline was that UFOs are not being seen uh, anymore and we think that they're not visiting us. Uh, and I thought to myself, I really feel like, they're just not being witnessed because most of us don't look up anymore. 
Right. You know, uh, our ancestors would spend time together. Um, even in generations, just a couple of generations back, people would spend time outside. You'd go for a walk with somebody. You know, you'd spend time outside. I remember being in high school and hanging out at the swings and stuff after school. Like, you know, like just a bunch of kids hanging out and like, you know, the sun would set. You'd watch the stars and stuff. And mm-hmm. I feel like now it's like everyone just walks around looking down at their phone. Yeah. And you see it during the day, you see it at night, and I think people aren't looking at the heavens anymore. And I think that we're not being thoughtful of the bigger picture anymore. And and such a sad concept because we're missing out on so much living these false half lives online. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's weird. Like somebody said to me uh, not too long ago, like, "Oh, you, you didn't wish your wife a, a happy uh, anniversary on her Facebook page." As if we, yeah, be, because she's actually, we, we share a, a bed and a, and a house, and I see her all the time. So I just told her, happy anniversary, <laughs> you know? Right. And it's like, if, if it's not done online, doesn't mean it wasn't done. Like, it's just, Facebook is not reality. Exactly. And it's just so crazy, man. And people think, like, you have to do it. I'm like, this is not a real thing. This is something we created that now is controlling us. And yeah. it's just very interesting, man. The things that you own end up owning you. The things that you make end up controlling you. We make things thinking it's going to get easier for us, and it says, yeah, it, it alleviates that task, and it creates something else that ends mm-hmm. up controlling us in the end. Yeah, I mean, everybody that's on Facebook, they basically want you to, or they assume that you put your whole life out there, you know, what you're doing, yeah. where you're going, what you're eating. I mean, how many, how many times do we oh. got to see pictures of what people are eating? I'll tell you what, brother, I don't think since uh, the Renaissance period is still life ever been more documented than now. <laughs> People love taking pictures. And trust me, I, I'm, I am also guilty of it because I, I'm a boy that likes to eat. And sometimes if I go to a place and someone crafts something really special, uh-huh. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll give the restaurant a little, a little notoriety for it or something. But uh, it's, uh, there is a lot of stuff. And you know what's weird? I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or what, but those boomerang videos where people keep going back and forth and it just kind of rotates back and forth. That movement makes me feel nauseous. I can't stand watching any of that stuff. <laughs> I see it. I can scroll right by it. I'm like, I just, I'm going to need Dramamine to go through my damn Instagram feed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I mean, there's a lot Weird, of YouTubers man. that actually do that, but they, they feel that this is the new era of filming, and, and supposedly that's what everybody wants. I don't know why. Yeah. I, I don't Yeah, know. I don't know why either. I don't know why either. Like, I mean, you watch a lot of the, you know, like, a lot of the reality shows. And I don't, I'm not saying, like, paranormal reality shows. But just, like, you know, like the, the, the Big Brother type shows and this, that, yeah. and the other. And I think it, and I think what the problem is, I think it teaches a very dangerous lesson for people growing up today. Because these shows all glamorize people that just scream and yell at each other. Yep. That's who the ga- the camera focuses on. The camera focuses on the drama. Yeah. So now we're we're we have generations of people that can't communicate, you know, and I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them that grow up because of watching television or watching things on online, they think, Oh, this is the way to get notoriety. You scream and you yell your message and yep. even our, like a lot of our, our, our leaders and stuff are like that. It's mm-hmm. like, No, why can't we just talk about stuff? What happened? What happened to rational conversation? I, I don't know, but it's it seems to go on the way of the dono bird, and it's a very strange and weird world that we've created. Yeah, I mean, well, everybody basically feels that whatever is done on TV must be real. This this is the way to do things. So, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with the ghost hunting shows. You got all these teams coming out of the woodworks. Want it? Want to be ghost hunters because, well, they watch the show. They're going out there and buying the exact same equipment that is used in the shows. Well, if it works in the show, this should this actually it should work for us too. I mean, it's got to be right. real because they're using it, so I'm going to use it. it just... Yep. It's, and this is and this is where the danger comes in, man. Like I'm all for people that see this and like, you know what? I would love to have, you know, a paranormal experience. I would love to try to communicate with the other side. Awesome. Mm-hmm. It's not just for some of us. Like every, I, I really think that we need to be so much more mindful of the spiritual realm and realize that we are spirits inside mm-hmm. and that we cannot just cultivate the physical world. We can't just worry about our material selves. We need to, to work in our spiritual selves. You know, that's part of my, my Christian lecture series. Like, you know, I, I go to the gym every day, you know, and, and just to stay healthy and, and to stay fit. It's important for me. It's, I feel that exercise really helps with my mental health as well. Mm-hmm. And um, I do that every day. But I also spend a good deal of time, you know, in my spiritual life, in my prayer life. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of times, and trust me, man, working in 
working in uh, in cosmetic surgery and stuff, I see it all the time. And I don't begrudge people who want to try to look their best through, you know, whatever means they deem acceptable for themselves. But, like, how much, you know, Botox and facial filler have you injected into yourself? And how much time have you spent working on your spiritual self and trying right. to, to be the best spiritual self that you can be? And, and I think people are just missing that altogether. And, yeah, sure, you want to go out and buy, you know, whatever you see on TV and you want to try this and that. That's fine, but like we don't all have to sing from the same hymnal. We can try different techniques. We can learn new things. We can explore because mm-hmm. that's how things need to start. Like even go old school. Like look at the old old techniques. There's still a lot to be mined there, and a lot that can be developed from those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, I know a lot of people that are actually still going old school. We're talking about going analog instead of digital. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> but carrying Absolutely. around that big and huge tape recorder. The people is, that love that. Yeah, but carrying around that big, huge tape recorder with a, a, a microphone attached to it with a three, yep. you know, six foot cable is <laughs> just a little ridiculous. <laughs> it's um, one of one of <laughs> one of the Johnson brothers. I, I can't remember if it's Keith or Carl. Uh, they were featured on, on on the Ghost Hunter show for a little bit too, uh-huh. um, and and they're local guys. And and uh, you know, we we see each other around. And um, uh, one of my friends, Cody, did a case with one of them recently, and he still uses the the analog tape recorder with the you know the cord and the microphone and oh everything. And it's really you know it's interesting, man. Like people like what they like, you know. And, I mean, and it's weird too because there is. I really believe there is a familiarity uh, that comes together between the investigator and the equipment and the medium of their choice. You know, Mm -hmm. when I was filming with the production companies, um, we have, you know, to keep track of all the all the uh, the recorders and the EMF gauges and the cameras. Um, everything's numbered and everything when you're done, you know, you pack it up, it goes back in the case, everything's accounted for. Right. Sure nothing gets lost between here and there, nothing goes wayward. I always like to use the same one. I want to use the camera that was number two. I want to use, you know, the EVP recorder number three because mm-hmm. those are the ones I use all the time. And I really felt like, I don't know if it was just a, um, like a cerebral crutch or if there is a real connection, but I, I noticed, you know, like if somebody gives me their SB7 device, it doesn't work as well for me as the one that I have. And it just seems like there's some type of connection that starts to come together. Um, it, whether, it, like I said, whether it's just because of familiarity or if there is some type of un, unseen, unknown bond that happens. Uh, but there's something that, that there is a connection, man. And uh, it's just one of those things. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, you're, used, you're used to that device, you know, and all of a sudden it's like it becomes a part of you in other words and if you're not using it yeah. well then that part of you is missing and you get something else and you're like this is not going to fill the empty void i need to have <laughs> that, that piece of the puzzle to make me whole again yeah yeah I'm, it's I'm, weird there's so much weird stuff i had one i had an old panasonic radio that i used to like and i still have it um and and i use it every once in a while but uh you know in the fall and traveling a lot it's one of those things i usually take with me and i just throw it on whenever you know and um i did it on a case once i was actually there i was in new york mm-hmm. and um and zaffis john zaffis was with me and we turned the thing on and there was a gentleman there who unfortunately had just lost a loved one and as we're asking, um, we let him ask, you know, to see if that person was available. And someone else came through that was almost speaking for them. And, uh, you know, Zaffis and I were speaking with a gentleman explaining that, you know, they were so recently crossed, like maybe they're unable to communicate at this point, but this person is speaking for them and is giving you the correct answers that you're looking for. You know, they're mm-hmm. kind of like their guide at this time. And all of a sudden, the thing... It, the the um the radio got really weirdly staticky. The lights started blinking on it, and then a different voice came through, and it just started naming people that I've worked with over the years, people huh. on and off television shows, investigators I worked with privately, just listing them in rapid fire order. Wow! And then all of a sudden, the thing just like died and like went off and put new batteries in it, couldn't get it started. And Zaffis tells me, "This is why I love hanging out with the old man." He says, "Duster, take it home." Put it out in the sun for a couple of days, then put batteries back in it. And I'll tell you what, it went right back to working like nothing ever happened. It's the weirdest thing. But uh, there's something about that, that old radio that uh, when I use it, I get really good communication with that more than a lot of the other devices. But why, what, what, what happened when you put it out in the sun? I mean, how does that actually work? 
I don't know, this is John Zaffis magic, I think. I'm not even sure. <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's like, you put it in the sun, leave it in the light. It'll, I'm like, all right, John. Like, I, I honestly trust John Zaffis with, with my I heart like and soul. If he says, try this, I'm like, you got it, Johnny. And I, I don't know how it worked, but it worked. Yeah, he's probably thinking, going, well, I just wanted to see if you would do it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I'll tell you, the old man pulls my leg a lot, so you never know like what's going to happen. But, yeah, that, that time he wasn't. He was, he was right on about it. Crazy, oh, crazy, crazy. But I'm still, and that's what I love about this field. Like, I'm still learning. Yeah. You know, I still learn from people that I work with, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be, you know, an investigator with, you know, the, the name value and the legacy of, of, of John. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some, some people I work with all, that's what I love about being able to travel, man. Last year, I got to be a part of 52 events, and I got to travel all over and see different people and work with different investigators, some that were very seasoned, some mm -hmm. that were very new. But we exchange ideas. We talk about theories. We talk about equipment. We try different things. We have fun. We make friendships. And you never know what can come out of that stuff, you know? And I'll be sitting at home, and all of a sudden, somebody will write me a message, like, hey, remember when we were over here and we were talking about this? Like, I've built this now. And I'm like, awesome. Like, how's it working, you know? And you inspire each other to go forward. And mm -hmm. I don't think that, that – I really don't think at any point we should have all the answers. I don't think at any point – contact with the spirit world should be so commonplace as picking up uh, a phone and calling somebody. I think that there always needs to be that mystique. There always needs to be th that, that, that wonderful, beautiful mystery of connecting with the other side that makes it just so magical. Because I think that if, if we're able to explain it all, we're able to do it whenever we want. Um, I really think it's going to lose a lot of its special. And speaking of special, so I do like my Christmas lectures and stuff because I, I really love the holiday. And um, I talk to them about, like, even when I do my paranormal lectures, I often will talk about, like, Charlie Brown. Like, remember when we were kids, <laughs> you would look at that, that wonderful Bible of television, the TV guide, and it would tell you, Thursday night at 8 o'clock on CBS, you're going to see It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. So you know, this is your one time this year to watch that. And your butt better be home in front of that TV as <laughs> a little kid. You're not going to miss that. Right. And now you can go on YouTube anytime you want. You can watch it on your phone. Is, <laughs> is it special anymore? You yeah. know? And I still like to see it when it's live on TV because to me it still has a little special magic in it. Yeah. But it, for everybody else that's growing up now where everything's instantly accessible, I don't think it's as special anymore, and I think that's what would happen if we find a way to explain and communicate whenever we want with the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, I'm sure you've probably gotten this question, we all get this question, why is it that whenever we're doing an investigation, we usually get communication of somebody that's always in the 1800s, but not <laughs> now? <laughs> um I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I get a lot of like recent people, but yeah, it seems that, um, especially being, um, you know, in, in the places that I traveled, it seemed to be like that was the most common time, like mm -hmm. this very early time period and stuff. And like, that's where you start to wonder, like, well, how does time line up? Right. You know, is that somehow tangibly somewhat closer than, than now or you know, like, how come we don't get a lot of people from the future if that's mm -hmm. the, 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 the case, you know? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Like, you talk about, and, and the, the different options that are out there, too. It's like, we don't always have to, you know, we think we're talking all the time to spirits of those who've passed away. We right. could be talking to people from the future. Frank, Frank, who made the Frank's box, believed that he was talking with aliens originally. Oh, he was the purple princess, and they would talk to him. And I was doing, I was doing, I was up at the Hinsdale house. Uh -huh. I was at the Hinsdale house with my buddy Cody, and we were doing the Estes Method, and we had like a couple of people up in the room with us. And Cody and I, prior to going there and doing that, we've been running different experience, uh, experiments with some equipment we were building. And um, we started to think that we were getting some alien communication because of the things that were being said. Hmm. And as I'm sitting there in the Hinsdale house, and I, I've got the... Uh, I've got the blacked out goggles on and I've got, um, I don't like to use the blindfold because, um, you know, with, with the Estes method, one person's with the blindfold and the, the soundproof headphones and the other person's on the other side asking questions and recording. Yep. Uh, and then the way you have to get the person out of the thing is you go over and you, like, you tap them. Right. Well, when Cody would come over and tap me, my first instinct is to like reel back to like hit somebody because <laughs> like I'm shocked. Right. You know, you're, you're in a trance for like 15 minutes. All of a sudden somebody touches you. You're like, whoa, what just happened? Yeah. Um, so I, I use really dark blocked out um, um, laboratory goggles. And this way, 
with those on and my eyes closed, it's pitch black. But then when it's time to, to bring me back up out of it, he can shine a flashlight right on the goggles and I can see the light change. And then I'm like, okay, that's a safe way for me to come out without having a heart attack. <laughs> and um, while, while we're up there doing this thing and I'm getting in the zone with it, um, I don't know what people are asking or whatever, but all of a sudden I start getting, we're watching you. We're watching you from above earthy earthy I'm like, what the heck is that? and I'm like saying the stuff and i'm thinking nobody else knows but i know cody must be across the room going oh my god like it's happening again <laughs> you know huh. and um so i start to wonder like maybe we are getting you know some of that communication like who knows with all this stuff that, that's what's so wonderful about this field man like you guys know you're out there and you look mm-hmm. for it. it we have no idea exactly what it is but we know it's something and we know we get things that communicate and interact and touch and it's amazing it really is such a rush it, it's not even just the adrenaline thing for me it's the, the the connection and knowing that there's more there's more beyond there's something else out there and to me that that moves me forward when i'm sitting there you know in traffic for an hour going five miles an hour to go to the day job all day <laughs> right. and i'm like there's more to life than this it'll be okay and just crank up my elvis music and just can continue on thinking about bigger things <laughs> right um, we, we've done something similar to that, but <clears throat> it's basically the Gonsfeld experiment that, that we do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those are really cool, man. Do, do, you, do, you, so like, do you use like the ping pong ball things? Or do you, like, what do you do? Our regular goggles would actually paint it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Awesome. And headphones. Very cool. And I have headphones, and it's plugged into an SB7. Right. And yep. I was laying on the examination table at the, uh, where the heck was I? The U.S. Marine Hospital. Oh, yeah. U.S. Marine Hospital, which is also called the French Fort in Memphis, Tennessee. And everything, I got the red light on me, and all of a sudden, the goggles just disappeared. And I could actually see the room. And Whoa. through the SB7, I can hear, hello. Hey. Hello. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, someone is saying hi to me. Of course, nobody was there with me. It was just me. So I'm talking to <laughs> right, myself, right. going, someone's saying hi. <laughs> but I had another recorder that was there, so it actually captured me saying, hey, I hear somebody saying hi. And it was plain as day, but the red light, and, and I don't, I can't really explain it, but it disappeared. I was actually looking at the room through the goggles. And they were oh, painted cool, out. Man. It's like the red just dissipated, and I could see. Yeah, that was crazy. That's awesome. That's awesome. I was reading just something the other day too about like um, a similar style experiment, but almost in reverse, where um, you completely deprive yourself just of your sense of hearing, and you're relying only on sight. So the, you know the idea that you're you're heightening that sense by by detracting the other sense. Um, but the the problem I have with that is that there's so much shadow playing stuff sometimes mm-hmm. if we're doing this in a darkened environment, which again we don't need to do it in a darkened environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd be interested to see if somebody did that in you know a well lit field how that might go too. And th- th- that's the nice thing. There's so many things that we can still tweak, that we can still experiment with, that we can still you know play with and think about. And it's okay. And that's what people have to understand. It's okay if you try something and it doesn't work, and if you try it repeatedly and it still doesn't work, and you say okay, you know what. I tried this. I'm just going to, you know, keep my notes, scrap it for now, and maybe someday something will speak to me, and I'll, I'll come back to this, and I'll, I'll realize all I had to do was change this, and now this, this theory might work. But right. it's okay to try different things. And yeah, like if if all you know is what you see on TV, that's okay. That, but use that as a foundation to get started. And if as you start to build on that foundation, you realize one of those bricks doesn't work, and one of those things wasn't right, destroy it and move forward. Do something else. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but but. Don't just constantly copy what else you've seen. Right. Um, it's, it's a great way to get started for sure, but you're never going to make any advancements of your own um, if, if you don't uh, explore a little bit. And it's fun. Get weird with it. Have fun with it. <laughs> just stay off that dang gloom and doom train. You know, it's, it's oh, a yeah. lot of good stuff out there. Just have fun. It, basically what it is is thinking outside the box. Uh, Paula did that at the Joe House Pizza. What would you do? I end up, like I said, I always, when we go to locations, I try to think outside the box as, okay, always do your history. What is here that you can communicate with that they would understand? And so I did a lot of back history. 
on the location and not just the location itself but the surrounding areas of the location and we, right and jailhouse pizza is a really cool place i've been down there and it's down by he's got like that uh, there's a, a big train track over there there's water yep. over there there's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff going on yeah. well in 1974 there was a tyrannic tornado that had went through and a lot of people had gotten killed along with mm-hmm. Uh, the damage to the courthouse, which happens to be right there beside of the jail, mm-hmm. and yeah. and there was like a lot of people had died in that area, so I thought, okay, why don't we kind to make our own tornado effect? And we got backlash on this thing big time. <laughs> well, and so what do we do if we do a, a tornado effect? to where what would be played out in this jail in 1974 when this tornado came through? What would be the response we would get? And it... it <laughs> we got response, that's for sure. It, it floored yeah. us. I mean, we laid the, we took a base amp in, we hooked it up, and we ran uh, kind of a, like a twister sound, mm-hmm. a big, dramatic uh, F4 tornado rummaging through and you could hear like the trees ripping out in the in the sound effect whole the whole ball of wax and afterwards we heard footsteps we were chased Mm -hmm. so it felt like someone was coming down the staircase after us as in a hurry and it 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 was amazing the after effect of course we got backlash about it because they thought we were tormenting the spirits and i was like we weren't tormenting we were just putting it the atmosphere back into what it was like in 1974. yeah see and that's like you know they have different ideas like you know singapore theory and things where you try to recreate Mm -hmm. you know the environment you're you're not antagonizing you're not cursing at things it's like same as like playing music. You're playing things that are familiar to that environment, and seeing what you know you can you can bring up with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's but you know like a place like Jailhouse Pizza, a lot of people go there, and what do you do? Well, you focus on the fact that it was a jail. So there's prisoners, 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 and you never think about what else is going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, up here in uh, in New England, we've got uh, just up in Massachusetts, they have uh, the Lizzie Borden House. Right. Um, the story of Lizzie Borden is very famous, and you know her and the acts and the, and the parents and everything. Um, and I went up there twice last year, and, and both times I've been there, and, and uh, the, the little bit of investigating that I've done there, um, I never come across anything Borden related. Um, however, I usually get stuff from children, and there's no stories of children passing away at the Borden house. Why are we getting children? And people don't realize that on the adjacent property over there, there is a story of children that unfortunately passed away in a well just adjacent to the property. And a lot of times it's, you're turning that light on. And you're trying to speak with spirits, sure, of the place that you're in. But you're attracting the ones that are nearby. And sometimes you're attracting the ones of, you know, the people that you're with. Mm-hmm. You know, I always tell people, keep an open mind. Just because we're, you know, in an old Victorian mansion doesn't mean, like, your great uncle might not show up tonight. Because he might, he might, because all of a sudden we're turning the light on and saying, hey, we're trying to talk to spirits tonight. And they might show up, and that's okay, but just be aware of it. So don't always try to paint it in that box. Like, Mm -hmm. so that was a wonderful thing. Like, you're not in the jailhouse going, it has to be a prisoner, it has to be a prisoner. A tornado destroyed so much here. So many people, you know, unfortunately passed away. I did did a case down in Galveston, Texas, same thing. Hurricane had killed a ton of people there. Mm -hmm. You know, but people going in the home, and they focus on the story of the home. Like, oh my God, think bigger think bigger mm-hmm. and it's like you almost want to shake people and i always think you know it, and you have to also remember like some people only know you know what they've seen on tv and some people are just starting and that's okay mm-hmm. um and and I'm, I'm totally for trying to to educate and also still to learn uh, but when i get somebody who is you know either uh very uh seasoned or brand new and they are not open to conversation about options um, it gets very frustrating because, listen, there's still room for understanding. There's still room to think, well, maybe it's this, but maybe it's that. You know, maybe it's, yep. maybe it's Bigfoot traveling through time. <laughs> like, who knows? Yeah, exactly. The thing is, you got all these groups that are coming out, and some, I'm not going to say a lot, but some refuse to listen to, you know, seasoned investigators, ones that have already been out there for many, many, many years, 
and they debate they basically know what the heck they're talking about but you got these these other people that are just you know they feel that what what they're doing is right and how they're doing it is right and they don't want to listen to anybody else and then of course that's where you get up into the whole thing of everybody wanting to have their own show stepping on each other starting to steal other people's evidence you know um working with other teams but then fighting over where the dvr cameras are going to go i mean it's just <laughs> totally right. gotten ridiculous but it's all due to the fact that well everybody wants to have their own show everybody thinks that they know everything and they just yeah. refuse to listen to the those that actually do know what the heck they're talking about right and, and you know it's and it's and it's a bigger thing too like i mean you're absolutely right there but it's like it's that's that is a sample of our society. So we talk about what we know, right? Mm -hmm. So our, our, we know our paranormal brethren and, and, and sisterhood that's out there. And we see that happening in these groups. And that's what happens in, in the same thing in larger society. We're all just products of our past experiences. We all come from what we know based on what has happened to us, what we've tried and what has worked and what has not worked and how it made us feel and how other people interacted around us. And, we get to a point where we're like, well, no, this is how it is because this is how it is. It's like, okay, but, you know, there's different ways and understandings, you know? I, I mean, just like, just like the people have killed each other over religion for so many years. Right. It's like God is supposed to be about light and love, but yet all these religions kill each other because you're not of the same religion. It's like, well, yeah. if it's all about light and love, let's focus on that wonderful commonality and then say, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe God has has different prophets of different skin colors of different of different tongues and understandings for different people of different lands because we don't all learn the same way because right. we, we don't all learn the same experience you know you live in the desert i live in the woods we're going to have different understandings we're all blind people on different sides of an elephant trying to figure out this part has a long trunk type thing well this part has a little tail it's still the same thing we're just on different ends and it's okay to talk and share and just realize that we're together in it, you know, and we're looking for spirit activity, we're looking for spirit activity. You want to use a spirit box, you want to talk to a flashlight, cool, just work Just work together in peace. It's not oh. that hard, kids. <laughs> oh, wow, you, you, you had to bring up the flashlight. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> that's my, now see, for <laughs> me, that's my personal least favorite thing. I've seen people use it and it has some cool stuff. I cannot be bothered to use it, and that's fine. You know, I like to use... My old radio. Some people hate the old radio. That's okay, too. It's fine. Well, I always tell people, I don't believe in, in the, the flashlight trick because you have to sit there and unscrew the, cur the, the, the cap so it's oh, barely yeah, you're, touching. You're preaching to the choir, my brother. But here's the thing. I said, <laughs> I tell you what, I will believe it if you use a mag light where there is no unscrewing. It has a push right. on and off button on the bottom. That's the only way. You can turn that sucker on and off. If that thing <laughs> lights up, then I'm a believer. Well, guess what? Right? It was my flashlight, and it lit up twice. Oh, jeez. Well, see, you get what you asked for, man. Oh my God! Be... <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh, I bet. Wow. And uh, this was an event that we were doing over at the uh, River Riverview Mansion in Metropolis, Illinois. It's a uh -huh. bed and breakfast that actually was used at a hospital during World War II. So wow. we were upstairs in the main surgical room, and I put the flashlight down, and I explained to my group that was there, and I said, okay, well, normally when you watch the shows and stuff, they always unscrew the headpiece so that way it's barely touching. And yeah. supposedly the spirit can use the energy to connect both ends of it, and then boom, flashlight goes on. I said, well, this right here is a mag light. There is no unscrewing the, the, the tip. And you have to turn it on on the bottom. Push it on. And I showed him. I pushed it off. Yeah. I put it down on the ground. His kid goes, if that thing goes on, I am going to jump out of here. <laughs> right after he did it, it went boom, right on. He's like, oh. he said a few choice words, and he was out. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, we know they are capable. And, you know, the, the, the people, the spirits in, in that realm are capable of manipulating things in in our our realm in our, mm -hmm. our timeline here um so yeah you know the a push button is a push button for mm -hmm. sure you know and uh 
it's it's interesting to see it when it happens, you know. But um, it's one of those things. Like, see, to me, like that is, uh, you know, for, if I was doing that witness that, that is a more uh, credible experience mm-hmm. uh, than for me the loosened flashlight, you know. Right. And, and but but once again, if that's what somebody wants to use, that's okay. Um, that's not my way of communicating, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't prefer to do that. Um, even with the radio, like I see some people that use you know radios like I do. And I feel like they just ask very open-ended leading questions and then just run with whatever they hear and never ask secondary follow-up questions or, right. you know, get verification, ask the same thing. Um, I, what I usually try to do is offer suggestions. Like, could you start by saying hi or hello? And mm-hmm. if it says Jack, I don't say, oh, your name's Jack. Well, oh, my God, Jack. No, I say, I ask you to please say hi or hello. Let's start there. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I, that's how I try to, to get verification for what I'm doing. Right. Um, you know, and then and then if somebody does offer me a name, I'll follow up. Okay, well, is that really a name? Could you tell me it again? Um, and then in one of my favorites is, is like, you know, giving a, an actual question that has to have an answer. How many fingers am I holding up? What color is my shirt? Like, and, and, and mm-hmm. I always tell them, like, listen, my disclaimer before any investigation is usually encompasses the same kind of things. I'm not here to try to ask you to perform some sort of cheap parlor trick. We're very interested in who you are and how you can communicate and where you're from. Uh, we're going to ask you a couple of questions just to get verification, and then we're going to, you know, let you kind of control the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's one thing I don't want to do is try to get them to perform like trained animals because I think that's very disrespectful. Right, right. Well, the other thing is between the radios and uh, the spirit box, it's all basically the power of suggestion. And whenever we actually use the spirit box, we will actually, you know, kind of similar to what you were saying is, but we will ask questions like, what is your favorite color? What What is your favorite dish that you like to eat? Right. Do you, do, are you, yep. did you drive? Did you have a car? Did you, did you like horses? I mean, we just kind of did just basically opposite stuff that would not hopefully show up um, on the yeah. SP7. And there was one point in time we were at a place called Carter's Mill, and we were like, so what uh, What area are we in? Because I can see there's select some jugs underneath the, the porch. Like, what was made here? And all of a sudden you hear, moonshine? Just like that. <laughs> a, like a southern right. woman. And we're yeah. like, okay, so there was moonshine <laughs> made here. I mean, what are the chances of that actually coming through? Right. And then we were like, no. so... And, and those are the moments where you're like, see, like... And I love it too because a lot of times at the event investigations, it'll always be, it'll always be that curmudgeonly person that got dragged there mm-hmm. by you know someone else, by their wife or or their husband, and they don't want to be there, and they sit mm-hmm. there like kind of you know close minded and judgy the whole time. And I'm all for skepticism, that's fine, but don't mm-hmm. like don't ruin other people's time, you know. Right. Um, but I I did I did um, I did two um, that stick out in my head just at the end of last year, and. Um, one of them, um, the guy was the guy was actually really nice, but he didn't believe in any of the stuff. And we did get very very limited interaction with one of the uh, one of the box devices, mm-hmm. uh, which I always think is good because I, I hate when it talks all the time. Like I use a computer program that I like, and um, I, I hate when it talks all the time. So when it's not saying anything, I guess it's kind of good. And we're going around and letting people ask questions. Like you know, wait a minute, you ask a question, and there's nothing, and there's nothing, and there's nothing. And it gets to this guy who's like the biggest skeptic all night. He's like. So what uh, what is this room used for anyway? And he goes, it's a restaurant. And he'd look at his wife and him. She's like, why didn't it answer you and nobody else? It's so good, you know. Oh, it's so great when that happens. There was I was in a horse barn. I was doing a, an event for uh, Street Escape with uh, Amy and, and Adam, and and uh, we were up in um, uh, we were up in New Hampshire. And I'm in this old horse barn, and it's cold, man. It is freezing cold. I think it was in like early November, and I'm up there and. Uh, and we're in there, and there's this guy who was just standing there, arms folded the whole night, just not having a good time. And um, I, the box actually answered a couple of things, you know, and it talked about the horses and the chickens and the stuff that were in there with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, oh, I don't believe any of that. He's like, I, I didn't hear any of that. And he points to this girl, and she had like a, you know, like a knitted cap on, and it said, I can't remember what it said across the front, the big white bolt letters, but everybody could see it. And he points at it, and he says, what does it say on her hat? And it read it perfectly, completely oh, clear. And he's wow. like, and everyone just looked at him, and he just he just shook his head, like he had no idea what to say, you know. <laughs> and it's like those are the moments where I'm like, yes, like so cool, you know. 
it's really nice, man. But um, like I said, if it happens all the time, maybe it's not as exciting, you know. Mm-hmm. But when it does happen like that, it's just like, and it always seems to happen to to those people too. And it's like, man, it's so cool. And I, I like to think it's nice too. You know, it's a, it's an opportunity of of enlightenment. It's an opportunity to to show them, listen, there is more to life to, than what you think is possible. Mm-hmm. And it's great. It's great to have that strangeness. It's great to, to open your mind to that possibility. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why I do my events. That's why I write my books. That's why I'm out there doing what I'm doing. This started as, as an interest. This started because of a little shadow figure. And it, it has grown to be such a large, incredibly large part of my life, traveling around, talking to people, exploring the unknown, meeting people, motivating them, and just spreading love and, and kindness. And I'm just so thankful for the ride that whatever that was visited me, um, that they put me on this path, because I can't imagine my life being any other way. Exactly. So the books that you've been writing, you've been writing some paranormal and some motivational books. Um, can you name some of the books that you've written? Oh, yeah, sure, man. No worries. Uh, the first one I ever did was called The Complete Approach. I wrote that with my buddy Barry Fitzgerald, and we're actually getting re- uh, ready for a re-release of that um, because when we first put it out, unfortunately, the, the uh, we learned a bit about publishing. Let's just say that. The gentleman we used to publish was not a... Uh, a, um, a, a scrupulous man, and he did some things with it, and then uh, he he rushed out a version that was not uh, completely finalized in the edit. Oh wow! Um, and then he sold he sold the copies of it, and then he disappeared with the money. Oh! Um, and then a lawyer sent us a letter saying, "Oh, he went bankrupt. Nothing he can do." So uh, oh. I sat on it for a while. But uh, my uh, my good friend Jessica, that I mentioned before, she's actually working right now on a re-edit. I should mm-hmm. have it in a couple of weeks, and uh, we'll get that back out this year. But um, then uh, him and I, we, we did one more book together called My uh, My Home is Haunted, Now What?, in which we talked about the different ways people of different cultures all across the world view the the afterlife. And mm-hmm. we talked about their stories and their paranormal stories and their understandings and what they do, and the differences between the cultures and the commonalities of dealing with spirit activity and understanding it. Um, and then I started doing my own, you know, and I, I wrote What's Next, um, where I wrote, you know, exclusively while flying from location to location on planes oh, and wow. uh, I told people my stories and you get a little bit of my travel you know uh, lust and wanderlust and all that stuff in there and, uh, but that was written you know it, it's a behind the scenes book um, about leaving uh, television leaving Ghost Hunters International at the time and looking for what was next in my own life you know mm-hmm. so yeah you get to hear about the conventions you hear about the show you hear about that stuff uh, but I wanted to inspire people to try to do more in their life even if you've accomplished some great things if there's still breath in your lungs, you can still do more. You can do more for other people, you know? So so I put that together, and I wrote And the Devil Shivered every day for an entire year of my life. It ended up being the uh, the last season of Ghost Hunters, so I had no idea that was going to happen when I was I was doing it. I got invited back to do that, and uh, ended up wrapping the show with those guys. So I was thankful for that opportunity, and um, it was nice to just to have a memoir of, you know, my life on the road um, and, you know, for my, my daughter to read when she's older, a, a whole year in our life together in, in my own words. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just uh, last year, I put out Kaleidoscope, Fragments of My Life, and that is, uh, there's there's poems in there, there's short stories. Uh, I studied sociology and psychology a lot, and being able to travel, I, I really took time to, to study the places that I went. I, I wrote stories about the places that I get to visit. And, um, a lot of people seem to really enjoy that one last year. So, and I got a couple more I'm working on now. But um, you know, if anybody's looking for them, they're all available on uh, on Amazon, or you can just visit uh, my website, which is DustinPerry.com, and you can check uh, you can check out all my books there. And we've already got like a dozen events on the books for next year too. So you can you can come see me on the road. We're going all over the place, man. We'll be in Arizona, and I'm going to be in Kansas, and in Michigan, and I can't wait, man. So many cool things. I'm just so thankful. Really thankful to all the people that come out and to be a part of this stuff together, and uh, it's it's a wonderful way to share our lives uh, together and explore and talk about all the weird stuff that makes us tick, man. Definitely, we're gonna have to get a few of your uh, books when we come up there to Gettysburg for the Gettysburg Battlefield Bash in July. Oh yeah, man. July what? Twenty fifth or twenty eighth or something like that, or twenty sixth or twenty eighth? Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, twenty seventh, twenty eighth. Yeah, yeah man, absolutely. I can't wait. That's always a good. That's yeah. I love being a part of the event. I actually just put that together with uh, with Steve um, uh, Barry just um, you know, last night and this morning. We were writing to each other about it. Hmm. In the last couple of years, and uh, I just had to make sure my schedule could accommodate it. 
to go down this year because I do like to do a couple of charity events a year. Right. Um, unfortunately, you know, like I still work the day job and everything. Reality TV, uh, you know, didn't set me up as a millionaire, and <laughs> nor do I care if it did. Um, I'm I'm thankful for the opportunities it's given me, but I still work the day job every day, and you know yep. it's it's a regular hustle like everything else. But um, I I love going out, and meeting people, and doing the events. But I think it's important to to always give back. And um, what what Steve does over there uh, with his wife for the uh, the Wounded Warriors of Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, and for the veterans there, it, it's a real meaningful uh, event. And I love going there. Um, this will be my third year. And uh, such a wonderful group of people uh, that come out to be a part of that. So, uh, so I'm really excited to go back down there again. So, uh, so that should be a good time, man. Yeah, it's going to be our second time. We were going to come down last year, but we had a few issues which stopped us from going uh, last year. But we are going this year. So nice, but awesome. Right now. You have the floor to go ahead and let all our listeners know where they can find you. Also, name off some of the events that you're going to be going to so they can actually come on out and see you, hang out with you, talk with you, get pictures with you, learn, <laughs> you know, buy your books. <laughs> so the floor yeah, is yours. Uh, cool, man. I, I really appreciate it. Everything everyone needs to know is simply at uh, DustinPerry.com. Um, you can go there. Last name is P-A-R-I. First name is Dustin with a D, although people still call me Justin, but that's okay. Um, sometimes they come up to me and tell me, uh, Steve, you're my favorite investigator. And I still <laughs> give him a hug because it's fine. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you go to DustinPerry.com, you'll see links on there for my books. Some of my videos and stuff are up there. And um, I've got uh, the first place I'm going is actually going to be over in Tucson, Arizona in uh, the end of February the 23rd. We're going down to Tucson in the slaughterhouse. And then I'm doing a charity event on uh, March 9th over at the Old Mill in uh, Dundee, Michigan. Man, I love my Michigan people. My Mitt people are great people. And uh, we're going up there, and that is um, for a, uh, that's a benefit for a no-kill shelter there hmm. uh, for the ASPCA uh, taking care of the animals and everything. And I, I love my animals, and uh, I'm looking forward to be a part of that. My friend Tim Mile that uh, that runs it is a really great guy. Uh, so we'll be up there taking care of the animals. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to go over to uh, Hauntacon in Omaha, Nebraska uh, in March. And then from there we go down to uh, Kansas, mm-hmm. Kansas over in April uh, to the uh, McIntyre uh, Villa. Uh, then when I, I, I get to go to Nevada, I never get to go to Nevada. It's going to be awesome. We'll be at Virginia City Paracon um, in May. And then we're going up to Portland, Maine. Uh, in June, and we've got a couple of things over in uh, Mass. So it'll be MI Paracon again, hmm. and uh, I'm not officially saying I'm at the Haunted Tahoe Biltmore event in uh, September uh, out in Nevada, but it looks like I may be, and then <laughs> I'm going to be over in New York for a little bit too, man. We're all over the place. we got uh, like another three or four events to probably announce by the end of next week too, so so thankful for everybody for, for believing in me and, and sharing life with me and being so kind and supportive. And uh, I love when people tell me about how, you know, they enjoy the books and, and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, for me, the most important work I do is uh, with suicide prevention and motivation. And if anybody gets a chance uh, to go to YouTube, um, put in YouTube.com slash Dustin Perry, you'll see I have 60 videos called Hey, Got a Minute. They're all crazy. Each day of the week has its own feel. This melodic Monday where I dress up like Elvis and the Beatles and Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson and sing songs and uh, all these things have just little motivational messages, man, trying to get people to look at the world in a different way and to spread light and love. And uh, I really hope you get a chance to check some of those out. Um, and just never be afraid to talk about your emotions. Never be afraid to talk about your feelings. And if you're in a dark place and you need some help, uh, there's help out there for you. Um, I always try to reference people and send them over to the uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. You can check them out at AFSP.org. Um, they have a lifeline that I sign off my social media Twitter feed every night with um, just in case someone needs someone to call because uh, life can be tough and it can be a dark world and we are in this thing together. Uh, I just uh, pray every night that none of you give up because it's such a blessing. It's not an easy road, but the uh, the horizon's out there. You just keep walking forward. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, man, I do appreciate you being on the show tonight. We definitely had a blast, and I'm sure our listeners are going to be giving me a lot of questions and stuff, and I'll put your links and everything up on the page so they'll be able to I appreciate go out there. It. Oh, yeah, not a problem. I appreciate it. Thank you both so much for having me on tonight and, and giving me a chance to talk with you all. And, and then to your listeners, I, I thank everybody for their time because life is busy. And uh, to take time to listen to something like this and uh, interact mm-hmm. with all of us is, uh, 
it's, it's something very special. Oh yeah, most definitely. And everybody, check out his kaleidoscope goggles on his. <laughs> got a minute for today? <laughs> yeah, those are for Wednesday, <laughs> Wacky Wednesday. We wear the kaleidoscope goggles. Man, oh you want to have God. a console experiment? Put those things on. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, you have to see the video. I about cracked up. I, I put it on when I was in my office, and I saw the goggles. And I'm like. Is he wearing what I think he's wearing? Yes, he is. <laughs> and let me tell you, man, you shine the, the studio lights on that to film, you can't see anything. It was crazy. <laughs> I had so much fun, man. Every wacky Wednesday on Hey Got a Minute, we wear those crazy goggles. Oh, my God. He would like my friend Nathan. Um, Nathan, he's a, t he's a choir teacher in the high school. Yeah. And when it gets to the last 20 days of school every year, he puts on a, a theme every day. And he has an inspiring thought to give to his kids until the last day of well, before graduation oh, that's happens. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> but he dresses that's up. That's wonderful. He'll dress up in a dra grass skirt as a hula dancer. He'll dress Wait, up. Wait, he's a guy? <laughs> he's a guy. <laughs> Dresses up in a hula skirt. Right. Grass skirts are for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> yeah, sure they are. You expand your mind, man. But see, in Gettysburg, we'll slap a grass skirt on you. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That's not going to happen. <laughs> All right, man. Well, you uh, have yourself a good rest of the evening, and uh, we will see you in Gettysburg. Sounds good. Okay. Rest well. God bless you all out there. Thank you. Okay. Same to you, you man. Too. Have a good evening. All right. All right bye. Peace. All right, folks, there you have it. Hope you enjoyed our Phantasmic Journey podcast season three kickoff tonight with sci fi ghost hunter Dustin Parry. So, if you guys are going to be heading on out to Gettysburg, I believe it's July 26, 27, 28th, it's an awesome event that's going out there. Um, it's a benefit for the uh, Wounded Warriors Pennsylvania chapter. So all proceeds from the event goes toward the uh, the Wounded Warriors. So it's an awesome event. And, of course, we will be there. There's going to be so many people there. So anyway, hope you all enjoyed the show. Hopefully uh, next week we'll probably have K.J. McCormick. I'm not really sure. Unfortunately, he uh, was a little under the weather tonight. So that's why Dustin had to come on the show by himself. But uh Fingers crossed. We're hoping that we're going to have them uh, next week. Hope everyone has a good evening and stay warm. Yes. Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guests to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. Your journey begins now.